Hey everyone, it's Pacific, and welcome back to another episode of SCP. Uh, still not a ton to talk about, not, not a lot going on, you know, we got Class of 76, October, we got The Dead, coming in October, uh, we have 31 Days of Horror, uh, Creepy's Daily October Marathon, uh, in October. Um, lots of things are happening, and I'm, uh, excited and nervous and a little tired um but hey you know what we're here you're here and i got a whole new episode for you uh so yeah uh stay tuned lots of stuff coming out in october uh but right now a new episode and this is all possible thanks to our patrons this week joining us is spoinky boy briar fletcher liam polk gabe miller 212 recon Salonaut, Juice Box Bandit, Blue Train, Efrain Ruiz, Angelo Kimmery, and Chad Underwood. Thanks for your support, guys. You help us do what we do. First, a quick ad break, and then this week's episode. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Whether you're selling a little... Or a lot. Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. From the launch your online shop stage, all the way to the we just hit a million orders stage. No matter what stage you're in, Shopify's there to help you grow. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash special offer, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash special offer. I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support, too. That's where Ollie comes in, with their delightful, hard-working gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. This episode is brought to you by Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Rated TV MALV. Viewer discretion advised. Maya Lopez has betrayed her mentor, the notorious Kingpin. Now on the run, she returns to her hometown to prepare for the biggest fight of her life. Don't miss Marvel Studios' hardest-hitting series yet. An epic five-episode event. Marvel Studios Echo. All episodes streaming January 9th, only on Hulu and Disney+. Plus. Warning, the Foundation database is classified. Unauthorized access will result in detainment. Within this archive, you'll find the procedures, descriptions, and accounts of the most notorious anomalies we've encountered to date. Secure. Contain. Protect. Item number. SCP-5520 Containment Class Archon Disruption Class 3 Kennick Risk Class 3 Warning Special Containment Procedures Containment of SCP-5520 is unnecessary at present. Should containment become necessary, Sundown Protocol must be initiated. The Lake Huron bulkheads will be opened. Flooding at Chromatic Abatement Facility AAF-W. This will activate the expanding foam seated into the facility, sealing it. Scranton Reality Anchors must be strategically placed to direct the growth of AAF-W away from Site-43, the bed of Lake Huron, and the surface. All access to AAF-W is prohibited. Update. Sundown Protocol may only be enacted by Overwatch Command, except under emergency circumstances. Description. SCP-5520 is former SCP Foundation Senior Researcher and Provisional Site Co-Director Dr. Wynne Ritterick. SCP-5520 is a Class III reality bender as a result of long-term exposure to esoteric materials. Correspondence with SCP-5520 has revealed serious and progressive cognitive impairment, dissociation, depersonalization, derealization, and both retrograde and antrograde amnesia. 
It remains aligned with the goals of the Foundation, but no longer answers directly to the executive structure. SCP-5520 presently resides in a series of vast caverns and refineries located beneath Site-43. Classified Acroomatic Abatement Facility AAF-W by former Site Director Dr. V. Leslie Scout. Though the facilities themselves exhibit no anomalous properties, their scale, location, and the activities performed there do. Both manual and automatic cave surveying techniques have been unable to determine the precise extent of AAF-W, a best estimate suggests over 2 million cubic meters of interior space. A breathable oxygen atmosphere pervades throughout, presumably as a result of SCP-5520's activities. Addendum 5520-1 Phenomenological Overview From 1915 to 1966, Dr. Winrise Ryderick, head of the SCP Foundation's effort to manage the toxic materials generated by its catalog of anomalous objects. His acroomatic abatement group moved from Vienna, Austria to Provisional Site 43 in Canada in 1943, and he became co-director with Dr. Vivian Leslie Scout. The applied occultism and acroomatic abatement sections of that site became, under his direction, the foremost facilities for studying and neutralizing esoteric effluents on Earth. When Site-43 was upgraded from provisional status in 1965, Dr. Scout became the site director with his partner sponsorship. Dr. Ryder disappeared from Site-43 on the 14th of November 1966, after 51 years of employment. Security and Containment Section agents searched his dedicated research laboratory and acroomatic abatement facility AAF-A and found it significantly altered and its 43 staff members absent. Dr. Ryderick's notes reveal dozens of conflicting, frequently incoherent or unintelligible programs of research, suggesting that his disappearance had been voluntary. The entire site was immediately placed on alert. Dr. Scout ordered the Pursuit and Suppression Section to investigate the facility further. Investigation Log Transcript, November 14, 1966 Mobile Task Force Delta 43, Pit Bosses led by MTF team lead Captain Garth Kinsey, a.k.a. Delta-1, leads a team of five MTF team members on an investigation of Acromatic Abatement Facility A. Log begins. Describe your surroundings for the recording, please. Roger. We're standing in AAFA, in what should be the basement sublevel. Blueprints from janitorial and maintenance say this is as low as it goes. Uh, there are considerably more pipes on the walls here than the schematics show. Some of them don't look right. Elaborate. I can't be sure without touching them, but at least some of these look like they're made out of bone? And maybe porcelain. <laughs> bone china, maybe. Hey! Cutting chatter, sir. There's an open door leading to a stairwell at the end of the hall you're in, correct? Correct, Control. No door or stairwell on the blueprints. Proceed downward with extreme caution, Captain. Roger. Delta-43, proceed to the next level of the facility without incident. Oh, what the hell? What's going on, Delta? The door at the bottom of the stairs is also open, Control. It opens onto a glass-walled tunnel. I can see the cave walls outside the glass. Illuminated by... I don't know. Illuminated. Proceed. Narrate your progress for the recording. This is definitely a connecting tunnel. There's another door open at the end. I can see a, a very large cave system outside the tunnel. Very, very large. Delta-43 enters the adjoining facility. That's... damn strange. Delta-5? This place looks like... <laughs> I've seen photographs from archives and revision of AAF-A in the 40s during the war when they were building this place. That's where we're standing in, now. You've just left AAF-A, Delta-5. No, sir, we've just left the present-day version. I'm telling you, this is AAF-A as it used to look, 20 years ago. Understood. Please proceed. Hold up. Report? We found a few of Dr. Ritterek's researchers. They're examining some pipes and taking notes. Approach them with caution. Roger. 
Hey! Identify yourselves. Silence on recording. Hey there! No response, Control. Understood. Proceed. Delta 43 moved through five sublevels at the new facility before reaching a door in the same position as the door in the present day AAF A. The door is closed, Control. Understood. Can you open it? Doesn't seem to be locked. Take a look. Roger. Oh. What do you see, Delta One? Oh. Oh, good lord. Uh, copy, Control. I see what appears to be a ravine. An underground ravine. Can't begin to speculate on the depth. There are structures at the bottom. Structures on the walls as well. Looks like a natural cave system. Uh, augmented with artificial construction. Consistent with the alterations to AAFA we've already seen. <laughs> It looks like someone turned ten factories inside out and stacked them. Copy, Delta-5. Would you say this ravine and its contents are larger than AAF-A, Delta-1? I would say that this ravine and its contents are larger than Site-43 control. Log ends. Dr. Scout recalled Delta-43 to AAF-A to regroup and plan further investigations. The research personnel encountered in the parallel facility were not encountered again. The identity and techno-cryptography section had recently completed the installation of an experimental site-wide computer system with a rudimentary command line interface. The Site-43 Information Network, InfoNet. When Delta-43 returned to Dr. Ryderick's office, they discovered that his network printer had produced the following message for Dr. Scout. Here in. I blame the comic books. I started reading them as a middle-aged man. Something frivolous to take my mind off toxicants and virions and threshold limit values. Something fantastical. I do some of my best work when I'm distracted. So many of those old superheroes were scientists just like us. They got their superpowers because something stupid but scientific happened to them. Jay Garrick inhaled heavy water vapor, and instead of gaining nothing, he gained super speed. Rex Tyler created a one-hour strength pill and started popping them like an addict. Ted Knight found the cure for gravity, and he used it to fly around and beat people up. My idiotic idols. I swear, Viv, I didn't intentionally expose myself to esoteric materials, but then again... Neither did the Flash. There were accidents, of course, even back in Europe. A drop here, a shattered cask there. An accidental exposure every once in a while. I thought nothing of it when my pants started staying up without a belt, or I stayed warm in cold weather, or I didn't need to use the washroom unless I thought about it. Just getting fat and hot and slow and absent-minded, I thought. Now, of course... I know it was just the maintenance of my self-image. Sometimes I'd wake up sweating in the middle of the night and find myself wearing my three-piece suit and tie. Sometimes I'd look in the mirror and see my hair was red again. Red like it hasn't been since the Great War. Once, only once, I had a long telephone conversation with my wife without remembering to dial out of the facility. Or remembering that she's dead. I know what this is, and you know too. I'm Dr. Fate. I'm bending reality on my knee. Things turn out the way I want them to, or the way I think they should be. I'm starting to be able to direct it now, which scares the ever-living you-know-what out of me. You know how we've made such great strides these past months? How all our experiments have turned out perfectly? That's because I've wanted them to. I've willed them to. Where there's a will, there's a way. But I don't have the will to be put in a cage. And you don't have a way of fixing what's wrong with me without putting me in a cage. So, at the risk of belaboring the metaphor, I have to go away. I hope I'll be back soon. In the meantime, I'll keep in touch.
Do you remember what I told you at the lake, Lydia? Now is the time. I'm counting on you. Win. INT technicians reported that the terminal in Dr. Ryderick's office was now networked with a printer in an unknown location. After consultation with the security and containment section, Dr. Scout began correspondence with Dr. Ryderick via the terminal and printers. Win, please return to the site. We can help you. No, you can't. But I can help you from down here. We've got the finest doctors in the world on our side, Wynne. Precisely. The finest doctors in the world can't stop what's happening to me. I'm a toxicologist, Vivian. I've done the research. You're a toxicologist too, so please don't lie to me. Think of your staff, Wynne. Is this what they wanted? My staff don't exist. What? My staff don't exist. I invented them. My whole department was filled with phantoms I imagined into existence. I'm just imagining them down here now. Check their employment records. You'll see what I mean. You know why there were 43 of them? So I wouldn't forget how many there were and call down an investigation on my head. I've had this condition for a long time now. I'm sorry I didn't tell you sooner. We can fix this together, Wynne. You and I. Why do you keep repeating my name? Do you think I don't know who I am? I don't want you to see me like this. It's better if I stay down here. What do you expect me to do? Let you hide out underground until you suffocate or starve to death? I expect you to be a scientist and let me alone to do my work. I'm close to a breakthrough now. Very close. Just... Think of this as an extended research sabbatical, and I'll be back as good as new before long. Now who's lying, Wynne? Wynne? Dr. Ryderuk was initially classified SCP-520. This file uses the present-day SCP-5520 classification, and appended documentation is amended to reflect this. The duplicate AAF-A was thoroughly examined over the next 14 months, revealing that it, like the original, had fallen out of use. It was determined that SCP-5520 and his phantom staff had moved into the larger facility in the caverns, which had by then expanded twofold. As SCP-5520 had not corresponded with Site-43 at all during this period, Dr. Scout instructed pursuit and suppression to rappel down into the larger structure designated AAF-W, and investigate it. A partial transcript of their exploration is appended below. Investigation Log Transcript, February 20th, 1968. Mobile Task Force Delta 43, Pit Bosses, led by MTF Team Lead Captain Garth Kinsey, a.k.a. Delta 1, leads a team of five MTF team members on an investigation of a chromatic abatement facility W. Log begins. Well, that was hair-raising. <sighs> Thank God for winches. What do you see, Delta One? There's a... skyscraper of machinery. Gantries, pipes, tanks, chimneys and such protruding from the cave floor. It's a, a cave scraper. A cave ceiling scraper. Must be one of the biggest buildings in the country control. Certainly the biggest thing underground. Understood. Begin your exploration. The first section of the facility resembles the Acromatic Abatement Group Laboratory in Vienna. The Phantom researchers are absent. The second section of the facility is unfamiliar to the agents. I don't think this is built to match any existing facility's control. The walls are orange. Stand by. Dr. Scout is joining us. Roger. You said orange walls, Delta One. That's correct, Doctor. With a gray stripe down the middle. Also correct, Doctor. Somewhere you've both been? It's the Tox Lab from Cardiff. Where we studied together. Did it have fluorescent lights when you were there, sir, in the, uh, the 1910s? Well, Wynne, 
the subject, might not be himself right now. Keep that in mind. MTF Delta 43 turned the corner into a large room filled with shining copper pipes. SCP-5520 is standing in the middle of the room, pointing at each pipe and nodding. He turns to face the agents as they enter the room. He begins to weep. I won't remember tomorrow. I... I won't even remember tomorrow tomorrow. I don't even remember tomorrow today. <laughs> Eyes on the target control. Was he a friend of yours? His unharmed control looks a little shaken, nothing bad. Bring him in, Delta One. Roger. Dr. Sometimes Rick. I get... confused. Sometimes. Dr. Ritterick, can you come with us, please? Oh, I'm... I'm sorry. That was my fault. Was that my fault? Oh, I'm sorry. What? Y you're not making any sense. One of the pipes begins vibrating intensely. The sound is deafening. SCP-5520 is nevertheless audible. Where did he go? Delta-5 reaches out to steady the pipe. Oh, I will touch that. When his hand touches it, the sound ceases. He disappears. Log ends. Hey everyone, Pacific here with a quick ad break and a reminder. For just $5 a month, you can get access to ad-free and bonus episodes every week. And now, a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks for listening to this ad break, and now, back to this week's episode. The five remaining members of 43 Delta were subsequently returned by SCP-5520, through unknown means, to AAF-A. -A. a message was already waiting for Dr. Scout in Dr. Ryderick's office. Vivian, I'm sorry about your man. You won't be seeing him again. I've connected my facility to AAFA. -A. Please send any new substances down the pipeline to me, and I'll see what I can do with them. Why would we do that? You're not a Foundation researcher anymore. You're an SCP object. That's a good approach to take. I've seeded the facility walls with a compound that will expand to fill its container, immobilizing anything it touches and anesthetizing humanoids. It's water activated, so all you have to do is open the floodgates to my cavern and you'll be rid of me. Oh yes, my cavern has floodgates now. I hope the underwater panthers won't mind. These were their tunnels, did you know that? They used them to travel between the lakes. I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that literally nothing in those oral histories was wrong. No response. I suppose I can't blame you. So, you have special containment procedures for me now. We'll call that our framework for a working relationship. Take my proposal to O5 and the Ethics Committee. Let them handle it. We both know you're too close to the issue. The good work goes on, Vivian. It must. By order of the O5 Council, Site-43 employed SCP-5520 from this point forward as a consultant researcher. Though Dr. Scout objected strongly to this practice, he agreed to remain SCP-5520's point of contact. The Foundation began sending problematic substances to AAF-W. Geological measurements indicated that the artificial complex grew at a slow, steady rate every day for the next three decades. The efficiency of Site-43 facilities improved at a commensurate rate, and SCP-5520 frequently delivered ad hoc research papers and chemical formulations to the Foundation via the printer in his former office. A partial digest of the correspondence between Dr. Scout and SCP-5520 is reproduced below. January 24th, 1969. All right, Wynn. We're sending you something very caustic now. Ah... You're finally coming down for a visit. I've missed you. <laughs> I'll tell security and containment you've still got your sense of humour. Maybe it'll put them at ease. In any event, please see what you can do with this stuff. If we can ameliorate it, we can lock up the object creating it for good. I'll take a look. 
but my sympathies are with the object for obvious reasons. October 13th, 1970. How are you holding up down there? I developed a method for stripping the human body of its mucous membrane. What? Why? That's not what you were supposed to be working on. I'm going to cure Qatar and the common cold. The mucous membrane keeps us from getting sick, Win. Oh. But you know that, right? Of course I do. I was just joking. To put you all at ease, remember? June 4th, 1971. We can't make sense of the data you're sending us. It's elementary enzyme design, Vivian. We haven't invented enzyme design yet, Win. Oh, well. Let me know when you have, then. June 29th, 1972. Stop it. Stop what, Wynne? Stop flushing your goddamn toilets on me, whoever you are. Are you there? I'm sorry about last time. I got a little confused. Yes, well, we're working on that problem for you. Is there anything else you need? How are those floodgates doing? The floodgates are fine. Maybe you should test them. What do you mean? Wynne? What do you mean? August 17th, 1973. I'm sending you the chemical equations and synthesis outline for a new antipsychotic developed at Site-19. It will completely suppress your reality-bending symptoms. I want you to make it, and I want you to take it. I want you to come back home. Vivian, what a clever formula. Thank you so much for sending me this. It's right up my alley. I'm sending you a list of chemical and procedural improvements. The shots should work much faster now. But did you take it, Win? Win? December 19th, 1975. This is what you wanted, isn't it? What do you mean? I know who you are. I know what you did. You put me here. You're keeping me here. You want me here, out of the way. You went down there on your own. I want you to come home. Do you think I'm stupid? Do you think I don't understand? I hope you never forget what you did to me. I hope you never forget what you're doing to me. December 21st, 1975. Vivian? Where are you? Vivian, I'm sorry. At this point, Dr. Scott reiterated his opposition to the project and refused to participate any further. SCP-5520 continued to transmit regular commentary on its activities to INT and respond to all inquiries, apparently unaware, most of the time, of Dr. Scott's departure. A partial digest follows. June 11th, 1976. Does chirality exist, Vivian? This is a serious question. Does chirality exist? Or is it something I made up? This is a serious question. March 8th, 1979. I don't remember my eyes. August 17th, 1980. Where are you? Vivian? Why aren't you here? Please find attached 500 pages of Toxidrome reports. August 17th, 1980. Why doesn't it ever rain down here, Vivian? It should rain down here. I need it to rain down here. December 21st, 1985. Yesterday, I cured cancer. Today, I can't remember how. Unless I'm imagining curing cancer yesterday, or imagining I've forgotten how, or imagining cancer, or... Imagining yesterday, or imagining today, or... May 6th, 1988. Please find attached one page of words. They're the right ones. January 18th, 1990. I've drawn up new manuals for AAF-C, Vivian. Please make sure you follow them to the letter when we build the facility 20 years ago. You don't want a repeat of what I just thought about. September 21st, 1991. I know you're not Vivian. Addendum 5520-2. Incident Summary. On 9 February 1996, Dr. V. Leslie Scout attempted to enact sundown protocol and decommission SCP-5520. 
Safeguards installed under O5 instructions prevented this act, and Dr. Scout was summoned to Site-01 for immediate questioning. A partial transcript of his interview with O5-8 is appended below. February 9th, 1996. Log begins. Please, help me to understand why you did what you did. He gave his life to us. All of it. From start to finish. To the good work. I owed him this... Courtesy. What you call a courtesy? I might call an execution. His life is not finished. With respect, sir. You mean you aren't finished with his life. We're not talking about someone's abandoned grandfather who just needs his loved ones to visit and brighten his day. We're not talking about someone with cognitive impairment who just needs patience and affection and rewarding work to live a meaningful life. Not anymore. We're talking about someone who's been completely alone and out of his mind for 30 years. Most of Wynne Ridderick is gone, and what's left is crying out for help, and we're not listening. I've asked you time and time again to let me bring him back up here, to let me see if we can help him. He might never be the same, but at least he wouldn't be alone. He could live a real human life in the light. He would still be brilliant. He would still be win if we could manage his condition. But you refuse me time and time again, and I've come to realise that you're never going to let him get better. You're going to keep him sick in the dark for all eternity if you can, so you can benefit from his sickness. We are perpetuating a falsehood through anomalous means because it is convenient for us. That's not the foundation I or he signed up to work for. Or built, if you please. <laughs> You're one to talk about anomalous perpetuation. How old are you now, Mr. Baggins? Eleventy-one, isn't it? I'm still myself. Wynne is not... Not by his own metrics. He left specific instructions for me on the matter, and his wishes are the only ones that should count. It's his life, and he put it in my hands. He trusted me as his friend and as his partner. I have access to the infonet feed. I've seen what Rhetoric is saying. Just last week he asked you to look in on Ashley. That doesn't sound like someone who's disassociating to me. <sighs> Do you know who Ashley is, sir? No, and I don't see why it matters. Is it his daughter, his cat? His brother, sir. His dead brother. Hit by a bus during the London blackout of 1918. He's suffering. And we're letting him suffer, keeping him apart because he's useful to us. You know what he wants. You've seen the feed. You've seen him begging for it. But you don't care. This isn't about him. It's about you. You want to hear what Wynne, actually Wynne, thought about this? Dr. Scout pulls a folded yellow sheaf of paper from his suit. Let me read this to you. What is it? It's a letter he wrote. He asked that I open it if he ever became... Compromised. He gave it to me the last time we went topside together. The day the site became official. The first day of April 1965. I opened it 30 years ago. Fine. What does it say? It says... Vivian, I'm so pleased I got to see the lake one last time and share that moment with you as myself. Before... Dr. Skull pauses. Before what's going to happen to me. I know this is going to be difficult for you to understand, but I have to go away. I am a danger to you, to the sight, maybe even to myself. I've tried to hide it, 
I've tried to control it, but I'm losing my grip. It's better for everyone if I disappear for a while. Hopefully I'll be back. But if I'm not, I need you to understand something for me. I need you to understand who and what I am. So that you'll also understand if it's not me you're seeing or hearing down there in the dark. So that you'll do what needs to be done, as you always have. As we used to do together. You remember what we used to say at Cardiff? I know you've moved on to magic words and musty dead old things, but I'm sure you haven't entirely forgotten. There's magic in these words, too. We are chemistry and electricity. That and nothing besides. You and I are the sum of our electrochemical reactions. Electricity is the fire that is our conscious selves. And chemistry is the beating of our hearts. The wet, sparking computers in our heads are the most powerful thinking, feeling machines in existence. More complicated than anything we can devise. More points of failure than any bridge, any airplane, any equation. They always break down in the end. And so do we. That ephemerality is part of the magic. The fire goes out. The heart stops beating. Sometimes the fire goes out first and we lose ourselves. We become not ourselves. Every human being has the right to decide where that line is drawn for themselves, personally. You know full well where I draw it. Words have power, Vivian. But chemistry is power. If you change the chemistry, you change who you are. And it doesn't take much. Yours very truly, Win. Is that all, Dr. Scout? Yes, sir. We'll take it under advisement. Thank you, sir. INT continued to correspond regularly with SCP-5520 under O5 direction. And Dr. Scout resigned from the SCP Foundation on April 1st, 1996. Colleagues, per your offer of employment dated 1st of April 1915, I must respectfully, retroactively decline. You are not who I thought you were, and I, perhaps, am no longer who I thought I was. You may keep your secrets, or you may benefit from them. You may not do both. If you continue to profit from the madness of our friend, you will soon find it impossible to hide him. The truth will out. I should like to see the lake again. Vivian Leslie Scout, Director, Site 43. He retired to the town of Grand Bend within the limits of Nexus 94, succumbing to advanced old age one year later. The following message was received from SCP-5520 that same day. April 1st, 1997. Vivian, the sun sets for you, but never for me. I look forward to seeing you yesterday. For today, the work goes on. Welcome, O5-8. Eileen Vikesar has sent you a private message. Would you like to access it? Yes. To O5-8. From Eileen Vikesar. Date, December 23rd, 2000. Subject, Project Rhetoric. We are ready to announce Project Rhetoric. This cover should address the security and ethics concerns identified by Dr. Scout allowing us to capitalize on the SCP-5520 asset indefinitely. Communications personnel assigned to the project will be rotated out regularly to prevent the creation of an empathetic bond and amnesticized. With your approval, the following message will be released to 43 NET on New Year's Day. Attention all sections. Welcome to the new millennium. The Identity and Technocryptography section is now accepting research-related queries for submission to its quantum supercomputer, Dr. Rhetoric. 
Contact Research Associate Lyle Lillehammer via 43NET to apply. INT will not be allowing users direct access to the Dr. Rhetoric feed. Its artificial intelligence algorithms are extraordinarily complex, and the results often require significant interpretation by trained personnel. E. Weixar Chief Identity and Technocryptography Section, Site 43 P.S. We've tried to modify the network and the printer to filter out occurrences of Vivian and Viv in incoming messages. But no luck so far. I'll retype each printout myself before passing it on to my staff. This week's episode was possible thanks to our patrons. Joining us this week is Spoinky Boy, Briar Fletcher, Liam Polk, Gabe Miller, 212 Recon, Salonaut, Juicebox Bandit, Blue Train, Efrain Ruiz, Angelo Kimmery, and Chad Underwood. Thanks guys, your support makes this whole thing possible. SCP Archives was created by Pacific S. Obadiah and John Grills. SCP-5520 was written by Harry Blank. Script by Kevin Whitlock. Our narrator was John Grills. Computer was Rissa Montanez. Control was Reese Torado. Delta-1 was Damon Alums. Delta-5 was Steven Indrasano. Dr. Scout was Vic Collins. O5-8 was Janine Bauer. Ryderek was Karim Kronfli. Vexar was Nicole Goodnight. Our theme song was done by Tom Rory Parsons, and our editor was Veronica California. Our showrunner is Kale Brown, and I'm your producer, Pacific S. Obadiah. Our executive producers are Tom Owen and Brad Miska. And this is a Bloody FM show. For more information, visit bloody.fm.